In today's lesson, we're going to talk about the character of the heat equation. So if you recall from last time, in general, we have some region of a solid. Its volume is V, bounded by surface S. And the equation for the evolution of the temperature inside that volume is the partial derivative of the temperature with respect to time equals the thermal diffusivity times our second der derivative operator, the del squared operator, times the temperature. In order to solve this equation, we need a couple of things. One is that we need the initial state. We might express this mathematically as the temperature as a function of x, y, and z at time equals to zero is equal to something, so some function that describes the temperature everywhere inside our volume. The most common thing that we'll do is say that that temperature is uniform everywhere initially, so that's simply a constant, which will make our lives a little bit easier. The other thing we need is we need to describe what's happening everywhere on our boundary. So we'll need boundary conditions. So the boundary conditions tell us how our solid is coupled to the universe around it. So everything that's outside our surface S somehow couples and determines what's going on inside. So whenever we solve a problem, we need the initial state and the boundary conditions. Don't forget that. Let's discuss boundary conditions. Here's our region. Now we have to tell the heat equation, which is solving for the temperature distribution inside this region, how does it communicate to the world and the universe around it? So we need to specify what's happening on our boundary S so that the material inside our region, our volume V, knows how to respond. There's three common boundary conditions that we'll use. Number one is that the temperature on S is known. So simply we go around the surface and we have some function or more likely a constant which is specifying the temperature all the way around this surface. Number two is that the heat flux on S is known. So we go to a particular point and we say there's a particular heat flux Q and we actually know what that value is right there at the surface. If that's true, what that means, if we know the heat flux here, is that the surface can't store any energy. So whatever heat flux is coming right at the surface inside the material by conduction must equal this known value Q. So the way we'd write that out is that the heat flux by conduction is the conductivity times the gradient of the temperature. We take the dot product with the normal vector. That's the amount that's actually leaving the surface at that point. And that equals some value Q, which is known. Probably the uh, more common situation rather than that we know the heat flux is that convection is known. So by convection what we mean is there's a fluid outside with temperature T infinity, so it's the far field temperature, and air or maybe water is blowing over this surface. Maybe our object here is hot. Maybe our fluid is cold. Brr. And so the cold air is picking up heat from the surface and carrying it away. Now the details of convection are quite complicated, but we'll make sort of a simplifying approximation. So we'll say that the conductive heat flux right at a point on the surface, so minus K times the gradient of the temperature, dotted with the normal vector. So remember, that's the amount that's leaving or crossing the surface. So the amount of heat that's leaving our volume V and going into the fluid that that's equal to some constant h, which we call the convection coefficient. The convection coefficient times the temperature on the surface, on s, so the temperature right here at that point, minus the far field temperature. Now h, knowing h is a very complicated process. Uh, we'll discuss this much later in the course. For now, if we have a problem with, with convection, we'll assume that h is known. Just as a rule of thumb that I like to remember is that if you have a hot object, uh, such as my phone, and if you imagine that being uh, raised to a high temperature and it cooling off on my desk just by air, that an approximate value of H would be 10 watts per square meter Kelvin. Okay, now let's discuss what is the meaning or the physical character of this equation. So let's consider one dimension, so 1D problem where temperature is a function of x and t only. In this case, our equation reduces to having a second spatial derivative in only one direction, the x direction. Now let's consider a temperature field at a particular instant in time. 
that looks something like this. So it's a hump with a kind of curvature downward. And so we remember the second derivative in space, that means that that's a measure of the curvature of the function in space. So when the function curves downward is negative, it means with respect to time, the temperature is decreasing because the partial of t with respect to time is a negative number here. So the temperature in the center here will be decreasing with time. So it'll be getting cooler. And this makes sense because this is the hottest point. The neighbors, if I'm sitting here, if I'm a piece of material right in the middle that's hot, my neighbors are cool. So heat's going to be flowing out from my point, And I'm going to be cooling down right in the center. So it kind of makes sense when we have a downward curvature that those things are decreasing with time. It's easy to see when we have positive curvature that those regions will be getting hotter with respect to time because the curvature is now a positive number. And if we have a linear temperature field, so the temperature is just a line, then that means its second derivative with respect to space is zero. And it kind of makes sense then that when the second derivative with respect to space is zero, the, time, the temperature is no longer changing with respect to time, so we're at equilibrium. And that makes sense because if I'm this guy here, my neighbor on this side is a little bit colder, my neighbor on this side is a little bit hotter, so this neighbor tends to want pull me up and make me hotter, this neighbor wants to pull me down and make me colder, so I balance out and I just stay stationary. So when I'm aligned, my temperature no longer changes. In two dimensions, now things are a little bit more complicated. So let's think about maybe a simplified case when we have two dimensions, but we're at equilibrium, which we define as the time when uh, the temperature is no longer changing with respect to time. So when the temperature is no longer changing with respect to time, that means that this relationship must be satisfied. So the curvature must be zero, but it has to be a curvature in a 2D sense. So what we mean by that, so let's imagine I have a square region. This side I'll hold hot. Those three sides I'll hold cold at constant temperature. So if we think about at equilibrium when everything has stopped moving, that the temperature field might look something like this. So these would be lines of constant temperature. Here we have the hot side, and here we have the three cold sides. Now, if we took a line right along here, and we plotted the temperature as a function of y, there's our coordinate system. We might expect then that the temperature as a function of y has to look something along the lines of this. Because it's held cold at the two ends, so it's held at some cold temperature, and has to increase to something warmer in the middle. So it has to look something along the lines of that. And so here we have a curvature which is negative. Now if we take a line along here, plot the temperature as a function of x, uh, our equation at the top that says our equation at the top that says the second derivative of the temperature with respect to x plus the second derivative of the temperature with respect to y must equal zero. That tells me since the second derivative with respect to y is a negative number, that the second derivative with respect to x must be a positive number. So our temperature field has to curve this way, where this is the hot temperature and this is the cold temperature. So again. This is the temperature as a function of x along this line. And this is the temperature as a function of y along that line. OK, so now let's use dimensional analysis to see uh, what we can learn about the characters of the solution without actually solving a problem. So let's take a situation where we have the temperature. So at time equals to 0, it's a constant temperature, and it's hot. Our object will be simple. It'll just be a ball with radius r. And at time equals to 0, I'm going to plunge this hot object into something cold, which is by magic going to hold the outer surface at some temperature uh, t cold. Inside our domain, we know that the heat equation must hold. And we kind of suspect that if we took a probe, temperature probe, and we put it here in the center, and we measured the temperature of the center as a function of time. It would start off here 
at T hot, it would decay and at equilibrium become T cold, which is the boundary condition. So let's use dimensional analysis and think about all the uh, things that are in this problem. There's T hot, there's T cold, there's the temperature at the center, there's time, the size of the object, and the thermal diffusivity. And so what we want to do is express the temperature at the center as a function of all the other parameters. Now the first thing we have to realize is that with temperature, it's always a temperature difference that matters, and the absolute value is arbitrary. So we're going to define kind of T cold arbitrarily to be zero degrees. Now we don't necessarily mean it's zero degrees C or zero degrees Kelvin, but we're going to reference everything to that. And so we'll talk about temperature differences. So let's write out our table with our temperature differences. So I'll write it as T center minus T cold. And this has units of temperature, which we use theta, since we use capital T to denote time when we do dimensional analysis which is a function of the initial temperature difference, T hot minus T cold, which has units of temperature. Time, which has units of time. And now here we see that we're starting to use T for too many things. So we just have to remember that when we put things in brackets, we mean capital T as being the units of time. And then we have our other two parameters, the size and the thermal diffusivity. Now we're gonna eliminate our dimensions one by one. Eliminating temperature is easy. So now what we get is we get the temperature of the center minus the cold temperature divided by the hot temperature minus the cold temperature. So we can see this has a nice feature that initially when we start off when the temperature of the center is the hot temperature, this function is one. And when it reaches equilibrium and it's cooled off, so the temperature of the center equals the temperature on the boundary or the cold temperature, it's equal to zero. So our temperature function is bound between zero and one. So it starts at one and it ends at zero. Uh, now we have just some other parameters to get rid of. So we have to get rid of time and the length. So let's get rid of time next. So I just multiply the thermal diffusivity by the time and I get something with length squared. And now all we have to do is get rid of length and we're left with the parameter alpha t over r squared. So what does this mean? Dimensional analysis then tells us that the temperature of the center minus the cold temperature divided by the, the hot temperature minus the cold temperature is some function of one parameter, alpha, the thermal diffusivity, times time, divided by the square of the radius of the object. So if we plotted our temperature function for a bunch of different experiments, they would all start at one and end at zero. And so if we conducted this experiment and we plotted them for time in seconds, we would expect one might do like this. And then if we took a bigger object, it would take longer to cool. So it might look something like that. However, our dimensional analysis tells us that if instead of plotting uh, everything as a function of time, we plotted it as a function of T alpha over R squared, that all experiments would collapse onto one master curve. So if we ran it again and again, oops, and now we're plotting temperature as a function of time, but not in seconds, but in this unit here, so in our dimensionless parameters, that all the curves would collapse. Okay, let's consider one other problem briefly using dimensional analysis. Let's consider the Earth. And we want to study the temperature as a function of depth. So I'll define that as my coordinate direction x as we go deep into the Earth. The Earth is covered by air. And the air temperature over the course of a year follows a sinusoid, roughly. In the summer, it's hot. In the winter, it's cold. Now, if you've ever been deep in the Earth, uh, not that deep, but in something like a cave, you might notice that in the summer a cave is nice and cool, in the winter it's warm, and that's because if we go deep enough, the temperature as we go deeper doesn't change. So we have some value of the temperature here, which is essentially the mean temperature over the course of history, or a year, and it, we go deeper and deeper and deeper, we notice the temperature doesn't change. Now, however, in the summer, 
temperature has to rise as we approach the surface until we reach our summer temperature. And in the winter, the temperature will fall as we approach the surface to the winter temperature. And in between, it might look something different. And it could start to look like a damp kind of sinusoid, maybe something like that, because as spring approaches, the surface starts to warm, but it takes a while for things to propagate and kind of pull the, the soil temperature up that's a little bit deeper. Now, if we studied this problem with dimensional analysis, we could ask the question, what is this kind of depth H where we have lots of temperature variation and basically to the point, you know, how deep do we have to go so the temperature doesn't change much within the course of the year? So this would follow the same analysis as the last problem with the quenching. So we have the same equation. We essentially have a one-dimensional problem with depth. We have the same heat equation, the same parameters. And so if we work out the dimensional analysis, we find that there's just one parameter. There's the thermal diffusivity times time over h squared. So we'd get that same grouping of parameters again. And so this parameter here gives us an estimate of what this depth is. So without even solving the problem, we can figure out that this depth has to be something on the order of 1. So this parameter, which is a square root of alpha times t. Here, t is sort of like a year. So uh, we could say it's six months. So we could count how many seconds. We could look up the thermal diffusivity of soil or rock or whatever uh, you know the Earth was made of at the in region we were interested in. And this would give us an estimate of what this depth is. Now, we'd have to solve the real problem to get the exact answer. But this provides a useful estimate of what that depth has to be is on the order of meters, 10 meters, or hundreds of meters.